That was a great contribution. One of the things I felt I suffered from as a kid was I never felt adversity. I was confirmed in a sense of unreality, which I could only feel as unreality. And that sense of being immune was ludicrous as it seems, a painful one. It was as if I didn't inherit my own kingdom for a long time. The world seemed to me to belong to the world. I could learn things, but they never seemed to be my own experience. I wasn't a child with tremendous yearnings. I didn't worship heroes. I didn't long to play the piano or anything. I did paint, but I hated painting, and I quit right after high school because I was continually told how terrific I was. It was like self-expression time, and I was in a private school, and their tendency was to say, what would you like to do? And then you did something, and they said, how terrific. <laughs> it made me feel shaky. I remember I hated the smell of the paint and the noise it would make when I put my brush to the paper. Sometimes I would not really look but just listen to this horrible sort of squish, squish, squish. I didn't want to be told I was terrific. I had a sense that if I was so terrific at it, it wasn't worth doing. I like to put things up around my bed all the time. Pictures of mine that I like and other things and I change it every month or so. There's some funny subliminal thing that happens. It isn't just looking at it, it's looking at it when you're not looking at it. It really begins to act on you in a funny way. I suppose a lot of these observations are bound to be after the fact. I mean, there's nothing you can do to yourself to get yourself to work. You can't make yourself work by putting up something beautiful on the wall or by knowing yourself. Very often knowing yourself isn't really going to lead you anywhere. Sometimes it's going to leave you kind of blank. Like, here I am, there's a me, I've got a history, I've got things that are mysterious to me in the world, and I've got things that bug me in the world, but there are moments when all that doesn't seem to avail. Each photograph for Diane was an event, and it could be said although it could be argued that for Diane the most valuable thing wasn't the photograph itself, the art object. It was the event, the experience. I mean, she was absolutely moved by every single event that took place, and she would narrate them in detail. And she wouldn't just say, I took a photograph of so-and-so in their home, but she, it was the going there, the being there, the dialogue that came back and forth, the, the moments of even just waiting and, and no, no talk. It was an incredibly personal thing. And once, you've, once you become an adventurer, because Deanne was really an adventurer, she went places that no one had ever gone to. They were scary. And once you have become an adventurer, you're geared to adventure. You seek out further adventures. And your life is really based upon them. And uh, I've, I've said that the photograph is like her trophy. It's what she received as the reward for this adventure, just like some guy climbs Mount Everest, you know, and he has a flag in his hand. And he, you see him there. Deanne has the photograph. I used to have a theory about photographing. It was a sense of getting in between two actions, or in between action and repose. I don't mean to make a big deal of it. It was just like an expression I didn't see or wouldn't have seen. One of the excitements of Strobe at one time was that you were essentially blind at the moment you took the picture. I mean, it alters light enormously and reveals things you don't see. In fact, that's what made me really sick of it. I began to miss light like it really is. And now I'm trying to get back to some kind of obscurity, where at least there's normal obscurity. Lately, I've been struck with how I really love what you can't see in a photograph, an actual physical darkness. It's very thrilling for me to see darkness again. What's thrilling to me about what's called technique, I hate to call it that because it sounds like something up your sleeve, but what moves me about it is that it comes from some mysterious deep place. 
I mean, it can have something to do with the paper and the developer and all that stuff, but it comes mostly from some very deep choices somebody has made that take a long time and keep haunting them. Invention is mostly this kind of subtle, inevitable thing. People get closer to the beauty of their invention. They get narrower and more particular in it. Invention has a lot to do with a certain kind of light some people have and with the print quality and the choice of subject. It's a million choices you make. It's luck, in a sense, or even ill luck. Some people hate a kind of complexity. Others only want that complexity. But none of that is really intentional. I mean, it comes from your nature, your identity. We've all got an identity. You can't avoid it. It's what's left when you take everything else away. I think the camera is something of a nuisance in a way. It's recalcitrant. It's determined to do one thing and you may want it to do something else. And you have to fuse what you want and what the camera wants. It's like a horse. Well, that's a bad comparison because I'm not much of a horseback rider. But I mean, you get to learn what it will do. I've worked with a couple of them. One will be terrific in certain situations, or I can make it be terrific. Another will be very dumb, but sometimes I kind of like that dumbness. It'll do, you know. I get a great sense that they're different from me. I don't feel that total identity with the machine. I mean, I can work it fine, although I'm not so great, actually. Sometimes when I'm winding it, it'll get stuck or something will go wrong and I just start clicking everything and suddenly very often it's all right again. That's my feeling about machines. If you sort of look the other way, they'll get fixed, except for certain ones. Very often when you go to photograph, it's like you're going for an event. Say it's a beauty contest. You picture it in your mind a little bit that there'll be these people who'll be the judges and they'll be choosing the winner from all these contestants. And then you go there and it's not like that at all. Very often an event happens scattered and the account of it will look to you in your mind like it's going to be very straight and photographable. But actually one person is over there and another person is over here and they don't get together. Even when you go to do a family, you want to show the whole family, but how often are the mother and father and the two kids all on the same side of the room, unless you tell them to go there? I work from awkwardness. By that I mean I don't like to arrange things. If I stand in front of something, instead of arranging it, I arrange myself. I remember one summer I worked a lot in Washington Square Park. It must have been about 1966. And the park was divided. It had these walks, sort of like a sunburst. And there were these territories staked out. There were young hippie junkies down one row. There were lesbians down another. Really tough, amazingly hardcore lesbians. And in the middle were winos. They were like the first echelon. And the girls who came from the Bronx to become hippies would have to sleep with the winos to get to sit on the other part with the junkie hippies. It was really remarkable. And I found it very scary. I mean, I could become a million things, but I could never become that, whatever all those people were. There were days I just couldn't do it. And then there were days I could. And then having done it a little, I could do it more. I got to know a few of them. I hung around a lot. They were very much like sculptures in a funny way. I was very keen to get very close to them, so I had to ask to photograph them. You can't get that close to somebody and not say a word, although I have done that. I have this funny thing, which is that I'm never afraid when I'm looking in the ground glass. This person could be approaching with a gun or something like that, and I'd have my eyes glued to the finder, and it wasn't like I was really vulnerable. It just seemed terrific what was happening. I mean, I'm sure there are limits. God knows when the troops start advancing on me, you do approach that stricken feeling where you perfectly can get killed. But there's a kind of power thing about the camera. I mean, everyone knows you've got some edge. You're carrying some slight magic which does something to them. It fixes them in a way.
I used to think I was shy, and I got incredibly persistent in the shyness. I remember enjoying enormously the situation of being put off and having to wait. I still do. I suppose I used the waiting time for a kind of nervousness, for getting calm, or, I don't know, just waiting. It isn't such a productive time. It's a really boring time. I remember once I went to this female impersonator club and I waited about four hours and then I couldn't photograph and they told me to come back another night. But somehow I learned to like that experience because while being bored I was also entranced. I mean it was boring but it was also mysterious. People would pass. And also I had a sense of what there was to photograph that I couldn't actually photograph which I think is quite enjoyable sometimes. The Chinese have a theory that you pass through boredom into fascination, and I think it's true. I would never choose a subject for what it means to me or what I think about it. You just choose a subject and what you feel about it, what it means, begins to unfold if you just plain choose a subject and do it enough. So much of photography has been concerned perhaps especially in recent decades with making the photograph look good almost with a kind of visual athletics perhaps uh, with formal games that can be played so well and so enchantingly and fascinatingly with photography or with more peripheral problems uh, such as how to make photography look like other fine arts. Diane knew that Edward Steigen said once that photography was born perfect. And Diane knew that. She knew that at its absolutely simplest, most primitive, most direct and unembellished way the, the problem for the photographer was simply to understand absolutely and with precision and with uh, sensitivity and with complete clarity what it was that was out there that you were looking at and what were the, what were the secret meanings that, that exist wherever, wherever one looks. If one looks with enough intelligence and enough wit and enough precise enough intuitions. The, the influence that she's had has been simply enormous because it looked, when all of us, when we first looked at Diane's pictures, it was almost as though, almost as though we were starting again, as though we were back in the days of the daguerreotype or back in the days of Matthew Brady. And it was, it was, it was a new, fresh, unused, medium again. All the, all the fanciness had been stripped away and all that was left was the marvelous, clear, airless uh, experience of life, absolutely without any interposition of, of concern for effect or concern for in a sense, any concern for art. That's a, of course, that's a, that's not really true. She was always an artist and she knew she was an artist. Her way of being an artist, you know, was, was to conceal that fact as, as fully as she could from, from us when we looked at the pictures. The thing that's important to know is that you never know. You're always sort of feeling your way. One thing that struck me very early is that you don't put into a photograph what's going to come out, or vice versa. What comes out is not what you put in. I never have taken a photograph I've intended. They're always better or worse. For me, the subject of the picture is always more important than the picture, and more complicated. I do have a feeling for the print, but I don't have a holy feeling for it. I really think what it is, is what it's about. I mean, it has to be of something, 
And what it's of is always more remarkable than what it is. I do feel I have some slight corner on something about the quality of things. I mean, it's very subtle and a little embarrassing to me, but I really believe there are things which nobody would see unless I photographed them. <laughs>